From the Shadow Exploded, page 58. Margaret White was born and raised in Mutton, a small town which borders Chamberlain and sends its tuition to students in Chamberlain's junior and senior high schools. Her parents were fairly well-to-do. They owned a properous night spot just outside of Moton, town limits called the Jolly Roadhouse. Margaret's father, John Brigham, was killed in a barroom shooting incident in the summer of 1992. Margaret, who was then almost 30, began attending fundamentalist prayer meetings. Her mother had become involved with a new man, and they both wanted Margaret out of the house. She believed her mother was living in sin and made her views known frequently. Judith Brigham expected her daughter to remain a spinster for the rest of her life. In the more pugnant phraseology of the soon-to-be stepfather, Margaret had the face like the ass end of a gasoline truck and the body to match. He also referred to her as a little praying Jesus. Margaret refused to leave until 1996 when she met Ralph White at a revival meeting. In September of that year, she left the Brigham residence in Mountain and moved to a small flat in Chamberlain Center. In a long and rather hysterical letter to her mother dated August 19, 1998, Margaret said that she and Ralph were living sinlessly, without the curse of intercourse. She urged her stepfather and her mother to close their abode of wickedness and do likewise. It is, Margaret declared near the end of her letter, the one way you and a man can avoid the rain of blood yet to come. Ralph and I, like Mary and Joseph, will neither know or pollute each other's flesh. If there is issue, let it be divine. Of course, the calendar tells us that Carrie was conceived later that same year. From Giles' Dictionary of Psychic Phenomena, telekinesis is the ability to move objects or to cause changes in objects by the force of mind. The phenomenon has reliably been reported in times of crisis or in stress situations when automobiles have been levitated from pinned bodies or debris from collapsed buildings, etc. Pages 60 and 61. In the opinion of this researcher, a great many of the people who have researched the Kerry White matter have placed a mistaken emphasis on a relatively fruitless search for incidents of telekinesis in the girl's childhood. The spectacular incident of the stone serves as a kind of red herring in this respect. Many researchers have adopted the Uranus belief that were there has been one incident, there must be others. To the best of my knowledge, there are no other recorded instances of TK in Carrie's childhood. Jesus watches from the wall, but his face is cold as stone. And if he loves me as she tells me, why do I feel so all alone? From the Shadow Exploded, pages 74 through 76. Probably no other aspect of Carrie White affair has been so misunderstood, second-guessed, and shrouded in mystery as the part played by Thomas Everett Ross, Carrie's ill-starred escort to the Ewins High School Spring Ball. Morton Williams, in an admittedly sensationalized address to the National Curriculum on Physics Phenomenon last year, said that the two most stunning events of this century were 9-11 and the destruction that came to Chamberlain, Maine in May of 2016. If the comparison can be made, then Thomas Ross played the part of a hijacker trigger man in a catastrophe. The question that still remains is, did he do so wittingly or unwittingly? It would be uplifting if we could believe that adolescent human nature is capable of savaging the pride and self-image of the low bird in the pecking order with such a gesture. George Jerome of Harvard has said in a recent issue of 
the Atlantic Monthly. But we know better. The low bird is not picked tenderly out of the dust by its fellows. Rather, it is dispatched quickly and without mercy. Theory hypothesizes that Ross and Christine Hargensen were at the center of a loose conspiracy to get Carrie White to the spring ball and, and once there, complete her humiliation. The phrase, dumb jock, expresses this view of Tom Ross perfectly. This author doesn't believe that likely in light of Mr. Ross's character, it is true that Ross was an athlete above average ability. Dick O'Connell, general manager of the Boston Red Sox, has indicated that Ross would have been offered a fairly large bonus for signing a contract, had he lived. But Ross was also a straight-A student, hardly fitting the dumb jock image, and his parents have both said that he had decided pro baseball would have to wait until he had finished college. His surviving classmates also gave him high marks, and this is significant. There were only 12 survivors of what has become known in the popular press as prom night. Those who were not in attendance, were largely the unpopular members of the junior and senior classes. If these outs remember Ross as friendly, good-natured fellow, many refer to him as a hell of a good shit. Does not Professor Jerome's thesis suffer accordingly? In fact, Thomas Ross appears to have been something of a rarity, a socially conscious young man. There are lots of people, mostly men, who aren't surprised that I asked Tommy to take Carrie to the spring ball. They are surprised that he did it, though, which shows you that the male mind expects very little in the way of altruism from its fellows. Tommy took her because he loved me. Jesus watches from the wall, but his face is cold as stone. And if he loves me as she tells me, why do I feel so all alone? From the Shadow Exploded, page 129. Before turning to a more detailed analysis of Prom Night itself, it might be well to sum up what we know of Carrie White the person. We know that Carrie was the victim of her mother's religious mania. We know that she possessed a latent telekinetic talent, commonly referred to as TK. We know that this so-called wild talent is really a hereditary trait, produced by a gene that is usually recessive, if present at all. We suspect that the TK ability might be glandular in nature. We know that Carrie produced at least one demonstration of her ability as a small girl when she was put into an extreme situation of guilt and stress. We know that a second extreme situation of guilt and stress arose from a shower room hazing incident. It has been theorized, especially by William G. Thornberry and Julia Givens, Berkeley, the resurgence of the TK ability at this point was caused by both Psychological factors, i.e. the reaction of the other girls and Carrie herself to their first menstrual period, and physiological factors, i.e. the advent of puberty. And finally, we know that on prom night, a third stress situation arose, causing the terrible events which we must now begin to discuss. We will begin with... Forgetting Carrie White may be a bigger mistake than anyone realizes. From the Lewiston Daily Sun, Sunday, September 7th, page 3. The Legacy of TK, Scorched Earth and Scorched Hearts. Chamberlain, prom night is history now. Pundits have been saying for centuries that time heals all wounds. But the hurt of this small western main town may be mortal. The residential streets are still there on the town's east side, guarded by graceful oaks that have stood for 200 years. The trim salt boxes and ranch pastoral lies on the rim of blackened and scattered hubs, and many of the neat houses have for sale signs on their front lawns. 
though still occupied, are marked by black wreaths on front doors. Bright yellow Allied vans and orange U-Hauls of varying sizes are a common sight on Chamberlain Street these days. The town's major industry, Chamberlain Mills and Weaving, still stands untouched by that fire that raged over much of the town on those two days in May. But it has only been running one shift since June 4th, and according to Mill President William A. Chambliss, further layoffs are, are a strong possibility. We have the orders, Chamble says, but you can't run a mill without people to punch the time clock. We don't have them. I've gotten notice from 34 men since August 15th. The only thing we can see to do now is close up the dye house and job our work out. We'd hate to let the men go, but this thing is getting down to a matter of financial survival. Roger Fearon has lived in Chamberlain for 22 years and has been with the mill for 18 of those years. He has risen during that time from third floor bagger to dye house foreman yet he seems strangely unmoved by the possibility of losing his job. I'd lose a damn good wage, Fearon said. It's not something you take lightly. The wife and I have talked it over. We could sell the house, and although we probably won't realize half of what it's worth, we'll probably go ahead and put it up. Doesn't matter. We don't really want to live in Chamberlain anymore anyway. Call it what you want, but Chamberlain has gone bad for us. Fearon is not alone. Henry Kelly, proprietor of a shop called The Blazer, until prom night leveled it, has no plans to rebuild. The kids are gone, he shrugged. If I opened up again, there'd be too many ghosts in too many corners. I'm going to make the insurance money and retire to St. Petersburg. A week after the tornado of 84 had cut its path of death and destruction through Worcester, the air was filled with the sound of hammers, the smell of new timber, and a feeling of optimism and human resilience. There is none of that in Chamberlain this fall. The main road has cleared of all rubble, and that is about the extent of it. The faces that you meet are full of dull hopelessness. Men drink beer without talking in Frank's bar on the corner of Sullivan Street, and women exchange tales of grief and loss in backyards. Chamberlain has been declared a disaster area, and money is available to help put the town back together and rebuild the district. But the main business of Chamberlain in the last four months have been funerals. 440 are now dead, 18 more still unaccounted for, and 67 of the dead were UN High School seniors on the verge of graduation. It is this, perhaps, more than anything else, that has taken the guts out of Chamberlain. They were buried on June 1st and 2nd in three mass ceremonies. A memorial service was held on June 3rd in the town square. It was the most moving ceremony that this reporter has ever witnessed. Attendance was in the thousands, and the entire assemblage was still as a school band, stripped from 56 to a bare 40, played the school song and taps. There was a somber graduation ceremony for the following week at neighboring Montman Academy, but there were only 52 seniors left to graduate. The valedictorian, Henry Staple, broke into tears halfway through his speech and could not continue. There were no graduation night parties following the ceremony. The seniors merely took their diplomas and went home. And still, as summer progressed, the hearse continued to roll as more bodies were discovered. To some residents, it seemed that each day the scab was ripped off again, so that the wound could bleed afresh. If you were one of the many curiosity seekers who have been through Chamberlain in the last week, you have seen a town that may be suffering from terminal cancer of the spirit. A few people, looking lost, wander through the aisles of the AP. The Congressional Church on Carlin Street is gone, swept away by fire, but the brick Catholic Church still stands on Elm Street. And the trim Methodist church on Outer Main, although singed by fire, is unhurt. Yet attendance has been poor. The old men still sit on the benches in the courthouse square, but there is little interest in checkerboards or even in conversation. The overall impression is one of a town that is waiting to die. It is not enough these days to say that Chamberlain will never be the same. It may be closer to the truth to say that Chamberlain will never be the same again.